as this will be the final uh, Memorial Day address of uh, Mayor Menino, who uh, I've been in the Boston area for, you know, you can't tell it by my voice, but the way I speak, but uh, I've been around here for almost 25 years. And uh, I was with the Air Force Band of Liberty for 20 years. I performed on City Hall Plaza. I performed in Christopher Columbus Park. Um, and this is just a, a really nice way for us to really come together as a community with the things that have happened of late and really, you know, be a family. So that's what we are in Boston. We are a family and we're a strong family. So um, I invite all of you on behalf of uh, Mayor Nino and Mr. Urena and all the Veterans Services Department and the veterans of Boston to come together on Christopher Columbus Park on Monday, Memorial Day, 6.30 p.m. Uh, the Metropolitan Wind Symphony will be performing. Uh, the Boston City Singers, those any of you who went to uh, State of the City, these young people performed and they're incredible. And it's a way for us to also bridge the generations together, having the children perform. And they'll be doing a very special um, uh, honoring of those uh, people who were a part of uh, the, the Patriots Day. Uh, things that went on Patriots Day. And it's just a very fitting tribute to the city of Boston and our indomitable spirit. So please, come out and support it. We're excited about it. We hope you will be too. And thank you so much for, for allowing me to come and speak tonight. And, uh, Hope you have a great evening. Thank you so much. I do. They're all back here on the table. Okay, well, we'll leave them in the back. Yep. So, any of you take them and you can post them in your condos and, and wherever. And, you know, we're really good about posting things in the North End. So, if, if you need you more, we've got 4,000 being printed. <laughs> <laughs> And the, the Boston Youth Council and the Boston BCYF are actually going to do what they call a guerrilla marketing over the next week all over the city to let people know what's going on. Good. Well, so if we'll you need them, let me know. Absolutely. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a Thank good night. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. So what we're going to do first this evening is give an overview of what we're going to be doing some of the very recent projects that we've had and some of the plans that we have for the future. So that those of you who may not be familiar with the uh, Friends of Christopher Columbus Park can see the depth of what we do for and in the park and the number of volunteers we have. We have at this point about 300 members and of those more than 50 are active and really active. So uh, we're going to start with our one of our directors at large, Megan Denberg, and she's going to talk about the top lot cleanup. Yes, so we have the tall lot cleanup on May 4th, and it's a huge success. We had over 100 families come out to clean up the sand, and I brought pictures. You guys can pass that. Uh, so we had the North End fire truck came, came down, and they let the kids spray the hole in the ocean, and they were like, you know, they were firemen. And, Big Joe, the storyteller, came. The kids would love the entertainment. NEMPAC came and they had a craft table. Kinder Care came and they did face painting. Um, and then Exhale and some other local restaurants donated raffle tickets. And we raised $376 in less than two hours for raffle. Um, and then Benvenito Joe Bono donated pizza. We had free pizza and water and juice for the kids. Um, and then the morning of, I went down there about 9.30, and um, we had been working with Bernie at the city, trying really hard to get the sand ready and have sand for the cleanup, because they take out the old sand and put the new sand in. But unfortunately, um, he couldn't get it in time. So Warren, down at the Parks uh, Committee, I thought, oh, I'd just take my uh, car down to Home Depot and put it in my trunk, and he said, Megan, why don't we take the truck? <laughs> so we ended up getting quite a lot of sand. It was a few times, a lot more than I could fit in the car. And um, so he saved the day. We got back by 11.30, and the tall started at noon, so we had sand for the cleanup. And we spent $569.94. So it's a huge hit. Parents really appreciate it. We cleaned up the sand every year. The playground, right? How much was the sand? The sand was two hundred and nineteen dollars and ninety-four cents. It was a great event. Have we built the city? 
And I think that story alone just shows the relationship we have with the Parks Department. And you know, we know Warren and all the people, and so we get into a little trouble last year. I'm so glad Megan was in charge this year. I was in charge last year. And I called it a, a, a sand and gravel company, and I ordered sand. Well, how much did you get? So I don't know. So I pace off the top lot, the, the sandbox, and I figure how much per inch, you know, get the, on the computer and, and the, so much, a ton equals this many inches. Well, something was off. It was a lot of sand. <laughs> I dumped the sand on that's dry on the sidewalk. And I'm like, oh, well, again, it was Warren and um, Steve, his boss, Steve Marillo. Um, so they have a nice little backup. So again, they save the day. And and they, I think, support us so much because we try and do so much in the park, and they, they recognize that. Uh, so thanks a lot, Megan. That was wonderful. Well, I'm up next with, um, that was on Saturday. Yep. And on Monday, we had a tree planting ceremony in the park. We lost two trees due to um, Hurricane Sandy last year. The, the uh, Greenway lost one all their trees and they only lost one. And they were right on, very obvious on Atlantic Avenue, right by Tia's. And so when we had our fundraising last year, we thought we went to a new um, donor, somebody we've never approached before, Sunstone Hotel Investors. And they own the building that houses the Marriott. So we went to them through the GM of the Marriott and you know, could you support you know, this park? It's every hotel in the world should have a park like that next to it. So I made the proposition to them that if they would donate $5,000, that would replace the two trees that were lost. So then working with the city arborist, uh, they told us we could do dwarf crab apples, which are at the south entrance to the park on Atlantic Avenue, um, or the north entrance. And so we said, OK, so we'll put the same ones there. So I've got pictures also. And um, Sal was invited to come. He was in a budget hearing. Done a budget, budget, budget. And um, but um, our state rep, Aaron Michaelwitz, was able to be there. Uh, Parks Commissioner Tony Pollitt and the general manager of the Marriott, uh, Victor Aragona. Plus about 25 of our members showed up. For Monday morning, that was really very good. So I can pass this to you and pass it around. Um, just to kind of see. Yeah, nice and Aaron, yeah. Especially the Monday morning. Very nice and Aaron. And so this is a picture I took yesterday of the new trees. And so they're good size, and they look really beautiful, and they're very, very healthy. Uh, they were put in by Schumacher. And those guys were right there on time, and we had fabulous men. So that's where, how we work with the local businesses. The Marriott's very supportive. Uh, Tia's, uh, Lori Lilly was actually there. She's one of the founding members of the Friends of the Columbus Park. Um, She's very supportive uh, financially, supporting the park. So we work really hard to work with the local businesses to help us do what we can do. Um, and so that was a really fun, fun, uh, fun day. Um, the third one is me too. The there's a when the park was redone in 2000. Um, for those of you who remember, the trellises were not in a straight line like they are now. They were one, two, and third one went this way to the Marriott. Also, there was a, a problem then with the homeless, the way that the vegetation was. And so the idea was to, to change the planting so that from the street, it was more visible for the officers as they would control. Uh, and again, the park was just ready for a facelift. So they did that. And when they were almost nearly done, um, the, the, the asphalt, Imagine, as you walk towards the Marriott, there's a circle there with three trees in it and some uh, perennials. That wasn't part of the plan. That was a last minute because the new friends group said, if you don't put something there, it looks like a parking lot. All it was was the end festival, which of course was supposed to be brick and that was a budget issue. So the, the friends got together with the city and said, do something, and they did. They 24-foot circle put in three nice trees, put in some plantings, no water. Because by then everything had been done. So for now, 13 years, in the springtime, it doesn't look too bad because of the spring rains, come July, August, September, October, and it looks awful. So we thought we wanted to do something with that. This is a 
picture. And probably, Steve, you may be less familiar with this than I'm sure that Sal is. So you can see this is just a lot of, you know, just walkway. So what we want is people walk by it. They don't, it doesn't, they have four benches that face away from it. It is nothing at all attractive. And in 2013, this space was in the middle of, in a nice park, but there wasn't the greenway. There wasn't the ferry terminal. You didn't have thousands of people going each direction in a summer day. So we wanted to change the feeling from that, and this is just feeling, to this. So it's something that we're calling it the Urban Oasis Project. So we applied for a grant to the Garden Clubs, um, the Boston chapter of the Garden Clubs of America, and the Blossom Fund, the Blossom Fund, and we have a $10,000 grant with the help of Tony Pollock, with Liza Meyer, the Boston's uh, landscape architect, uh, with the help of a landscape, another landscape architect. We've got a back of the envelope estimate of costs. And it's about seventy-five to $80,000. To take this 24-foot circle and expand it three times as big, maybe four times as big, we don't know what the shape will be. That will come later. Then we applied for the Beautify Boston grant through the city of Boston. And we got $20,000. So we're up to $30,000. We have 50 to go. Uh, we have just, again, with the help of the Parks Department, because none of us, we do a lot of things that none of us have ever done. <laughs> but we kind of launch in and go, wow, that's a good idea. How do we do it? And, um, and with the energy that's in this group, it moves forward. and. Who knew that we have one of our friends who was a grant writer? So when we started doing the grant, she was helping us with the grant. Um, and it's that kind of talent that we have. And then we just ask a lot of questions. I don't think any of us are ever afraid to say we don't know how to do this. Please help us. So the Parks Department, um, Sherry Gildersma, who is project manager for the Parks Department, helped us with the RFQ, Request for Qualifications, that just went out on Thursday, last Thursday. So that went to three landscape architects and giving them their uh, our budget and we're requesting their qualifications and if they're interested in helping us with this project. Our vision is that, it's gonna be pretty quick, um, we will uh, get them to respond within a couple of weeks, we'll interview them, talk with them, get their vision for this, uh, and then they have to source the materials, come up with the design, help us find the construction company that would do this, and the construction would start somewhere around the middle of September. And uh, October 14th is Columbus Day, we're having an event in the park, so somehow, as we make, we have a parade in the park, and how tiny that park is, we have a wonderful little parade, so and somehow as we loop around this area, we walk right past this, we'll stop and have a little ceremony there. Uh, hopefully, Mayor Benito will be, be able to be there. Um, I think he thinks of this as a special park. So this is our biggest project of the year. And when we get this done, it's just going to be, it's just going to be the, the icing on the cake. You know, it's already gorgeous. And this is going to be transformed into a, an urban oasis where people can sit. Quiet little paths go through it. It's not very big, but I think it's, it's going to be just fabulous. It's going to be really fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's in process, and then Virginia Kimball, our treasurer, is going to talk about our Harbor Sunset Cruise. It is the Harbor Sunset Cruise is set for July 17th. It's in the evening again. I think it's up. Third, 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 I promise I'm all right. I promise you last year. <laughs> so um, again, it's members and the guests. It's not something that you know we're not looking for 500 people, but it's if you've been, it's always a fabulous night. I contacted the caterer that we've used the last few years, so we should be all set with her, and we're going to keep the price at $45 a person. Now that covers, and any proceeds from this are marked for the Columbus Day event. So, you know, that kind of helps fund that. And we do it that way. But that's, that's about it. It'll be on the website soon to buy your tickets. And what's that something up? She's telling me something. What? You're having swag bags. Oh, well, that's a secret. <laughs> well, we should have some nice extras this year. I'm working on a, a few extra things this year. Special night. 
everybody, for all our members. It's kind of going to be my member appreciation sunset cruise this year. Okay, so um, we will have the information on, on the website. Okay, great. Thank you, Virginia. So that is a members only event. You can't come on unless you're a member or a friend of a member. So that helps encourage people to join. And it is a really fun time. Uh, when people join the Friends of Christopher Columbus Park, they get very involved, many get very involved very quickly. And one who has done this, two people actually, uh, Kathleen Tedesco and her friend Laura Benevento, uh, have been members for less than a year. And they have been very, very active. And they are now, they are chairing our 4th of July celebration. Uh, so Laura is here to talk about that. Yes, we get right involved. Um, okay, I'm Laura, and uh, before the July celebration is Saturday, June 29th, from um, 11 to 3. And I do have a lot of people that have signed up, but you know there's always room for more. Yeah. We've got a great venue going, um, a magician, and Mavis taking care of that, marionettes, Kathy Ray. Man Pack is still under, they're coming, but we don't know who's getting involved with them. Still Walker is D. Bendel, storyteller, Kathy McCarthy, T Bone, Patricia. Um, so those those are the people that are going to be going. And they just we're starting with the parade. Then Pack is going to be involved in that, leading with the drum and um, and I spoke to um, Sarah and she's got lot going with them. Besides the games, they're going to do, I forget what you call them, but I think you've seen the advertisement on TV. They have the singers, you know, like in the mall, you know, all of a sudden somebody starts yeah, singing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, she's going to do that. So that should be fun. You know, something different. And this other guy that we got, T-Bone, actually was Patricia. There she is. She saw him up in uh, Vermont. And I've spoken to him many times. He sounds like he's got a dynamite show going, gets the kids involved. He's going to be a whole hour performing. So, uh, you know, we've got great raffles going. So, if you want me to pass the list around again for people to sign up. Yes. Lori, do you need somebody to be in contact with Medpac? Yeah. I'd be happy to do that. Fabulous. I'm and just have you that. already, have you given them any particulars about what you want? Well, I've spoken to her, yeah. To Sherry. Yeah, Sherry, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I just told her who, who's going to call back to tell her who the contact person was. I'll be happy to be in contact with Sherry. Sure. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to see her tomorrow. Right. So that's it. I hope you're all going to come. Uh, like I said, we could use more volunteers, especially day of, you know, putting the balloons up, um, passing out the flags. We've got. According to who's there, and decide how we're going to <coughs> how we're going to separate. As the parade goes, we're going to have about two or three people, you know, within holding you know holding the flag so that the groups go in different directions when we get to the statue. I just wondered if you heard anything about the fire engine. Yeah, we're working on that. Oh, good. If they're available, they'll come. Okay. So Megan's yeah. charging. So that's it. Um, I'm going to pass this around again. If there's anything in particular you'd like to do, just put your name next to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, it's going to cost us about $3,500, but it's money. It's raised by, you know, 100%. We have to find this I didn't hear the by the way, Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, it's going to cost about $3,500 for the vendors and everything. And the balloons and stuff again, but that money has already been raised by uh, friends of his colleagues. Oh, excellent! Well, that's that's fantastic. But we're gonna have raffles, so we hope to raise even more. You know? Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Laura. Uh, so last year was our first Fourth of July event, and we did it because the tall ships were coming in. And we have the other events that we do. We have a magician who comes most times. And we need a juggler last year, so we keep trying to find new, it's all just for the kids. 
uh, find new events. And we found Uncle Sam on stilts last year. And um, Dee walked, Dee Dental walked around with him. We gave out the 300 American flags, little flags for the kids. And Laura can get them again. But the cutest thing about it was, as we did the parade through the park, he, there were parts he couldn't walk on. And we get down to Atlantic Avenue, and there's the uh, Uncle Sam on stilts standing there, and he's got his legs spread. And I'm leading it with other board members, and I, I have uh, five-year-old twin grandsons, and they were up from Maryland, so they're next to me. And I'm like, what is he doing? You know, he's blocking the whole thing. And then I realized that the children just went right through the house. <laughs> so it just, it set the tone for the whole day. And it's it's not only people from the neighborhood, because we get a lot of them, but then people just stumble on it. They come from the burbs, they come from anywhere. And they wow, what an amazing event. And it's free. You know, we post signs all over saying, free, please join us. So uh, again, that's Saturday, June 29th from uh, 11 a.m. to 11 to 3. And part of what makes all this possible before, besides our fundraising with the corporate, member, uh, corporate uh, businesses around the park uh, is our memberships, which are very important. Not only for the dollars raised, but the energy that the members bring to this. And our, Beverly, our, our membership chair, Beverly Knight, will talk about that. Yes, that's what I was thinking. Members, 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 members. So thank you all for being here. And uh, basically, over the last couple of years, we've experienced approximately 40% growth each of the last two years. So while we are continuing on that um, desire for growth, we actually would like to communicate more to our members uh, how important their input and their just being a part of our organization means. And our goal in communicating that value to each and every one of you is the hope for additional involvement and additional uh, talents for all these wonderful events that we've got going. Uh, Virginia mentioned uh, a members only event in the cruise. Within the next couple of weeks, uh, there will be a members only event at the Palm Restaurant. The Palm Restaurant has uh, cordially invited President Christopher Thomas Park, the members of the FLCCP for a reception, uh, welcoming us to their restaurant in, uh, new in our neighborhood. So be sure to look for that information. It'll come out either in newsletter form or on the website. If you have not signed up, if you are not a current member, please get your memberships in. And uh, we've got extra membership invitations at the table. And we'd also love for you to invite your neighbors and friends and co-workers and relatives. Thank you. I see Councilor Roy has just arrived. Thank you very much for coming.
Uh, all of you know the blue lights on the trellis, and they're lit the Monday before Thanksgiving, and we turn them off right after right after Patriots Day, so that people who come from all over the world can see them. We also light 14 trees in the park, and the cost of this on an average year is about $30,000. And when we have to replace all the blue lights on the trellis, which is every three or four years, that kicks it up to about $45,000. So we're raising all this money, again, through memberships and corporate sponsorships. And uh, this year, we may, we don't know if we need to change it this year or not. Our infrastructure chair, Ford Cavallari, who's not here, uh, he's at the Greenway ga Gala with his, uh, his partner, Robin Reed, who's our horticulture chair. And Robin is also on the board of the Greenway, so it's all very interconnected. Um, but Ford has been investigating some new lightings this rope lighting, and we'll be meeting with the uh, electrician uh, in the next week to see if this is something that's practical for our park. The initial cost of installation would be a lot more than the little LEDs we're using. But if they last twice as long, it'll probably in the long run be uh, significantly cheaper. So that, we feel, it's, that's our big contribution to the city. All these events for the neighborhood uh, that we do, and the movies, and it all kind of grows. I think this is the first year in about five or six years that we don't have a new event. So, well, yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we got the, no, am I saying? We got the uh, Oasis Project. Um, so every year we add something new, and it's only because of the energy of the members in conjunction with the support we get from the city. Sal has been a wonderful city councilor for us. There has never been once that I've called his office that we haven't had a, a quick response. Uh, and then with the Parks Department. Tony Pollock is amazing. Her staff is amazing. They've been so supportive. And it's from that energy and synergy that the, um, the topic of this evening's meeting uh, it's difficult because things have changed in our neighborhood. Uh, I've lived here 17 years, and long before when I moved in here, you know, there was the elevated highway, and I kept asking people, "Who's paying for this?" It was interesting; nobody knew, and didn't didn't even realize it was a federal project. And then I watched it. I live in Harbor Towers, so you know, we all all who live in the North End, we all watched what happened, and we all knew not to cross any street without looking 360. And so we lived through the big day, and now we have the gorgeous greenway there that abuts our gorgeous park. But things have changed, and there are always issues with the homeless, and, and it's tough, you know, it's, it's difficult for everybody how do you deal with this. Um, and it's not just our park, of course, it's, it's a citywide, a statewide, a worldwide problem, actually. I have friends visiting from Scotland, and they were talking about their, excuse me, their issues. So it's complex, but we wanted to share our personal experiences with the city councilors and then to get your take on what you can do to help us, what we can do to help you, and how we can have a really safe park. And I wanted to share some of the things that have happened in the last year. Um, on April 24th, uh, a, a man uh, there were three people sitting on the chains at the harbor's edge in Columbus Park. The police officers, I happened to stumble on this incident right after it happened and talked to the police officers. And they theorized, I think based on witnesses, uh, that one gentleman got an argument with the other one and pushed him in the, in the harbor. The man was rescued from the harbor, taken to MGH, and he subsequently died. Um, he is listed in his obituary as being homeless. Uh, I actually had an email from his dad and asking, you know, what do you know about it? Um, and so I shared what I knew. I shared with him the tremendous police response. His feeling was that because his son had issues, his son was 30 years old, because he had issues that perhaps the police hadn't responded, and I could tell him no. There was a squad car, or there was an unmarked car zooming down Atlantic Avenue for guys in suits. I, I figured they were probably detectives. There were three more on site. There was a, a sergeant. There was a lieutenant I met, Lieutenant O'Brien. 
in. It was a squad car with two officers. It was a lot of presence there. So they didn't take this lightly. They, and they, they thought that they were homeless, but that didn't matter. They were there. They were responding. And the dad really appreciated knowing that. So I, maybe that was the reason I was there. I don't know. Um, but that's what sparked us to say, you know, maybe we need to talk about this bigger. Because last year, a year ago, um, a dad went into the, the playground with his little ones at about 7.30 in the morning. Wednesday or Thursday morning, and he found razor blades, and he found the tunnels that the children crawled through were blood smeared. And he called 911, and he called the mayor's office, and I find out about this by a, an email that sent him out to the mother's group. So I went out a couple hours later, and uh, thought, well, I'll just go check out the park and see if everything's been cleaned up. And it was teeming with moms and kids, 20, 25 people. And I thought, well, so I thought it must be all cleaned up. So I go in and um, look around, and a little child is coming through the tunnel at me, and there's all this blood. And I made him stop, and I closed down the, um, the playground. I told all the moms who I was, and I said, we've got a health issue here, safety issue. They understood, and then I just started making phone calls. I'm calling Sal's office. I'm calling the Parks Department. I'm calling anybody. Can, and I stood there for two hours. And Jim Green called him. He was out of town. Jim is with the, the homeless emergency <laughs> homeless emergency shelter commission. <coughs> Got a hold of him. He called me back, uh, even though he was away on a conference. And um, the response, it took a long time. It took a lot longer than it should have. The solution was for Parks Department guys to come, and they had jugs of pine salt, and they were throwing pine salt on it. And I said, is that going to kill HIV or any other you know, hepatitis? They didn't know. There was no protocol for that. I subsequently followed up with the health department, and there really doesn't seem to be any protocol. But that sparked us being much more vigilant about the, the <coughs> playground. And Jim and the folks at Pine Street Inn would monitor more the police officers. But many times, way too many times, I found I would go early in the morning or go with a friend like at 10 o'clock at night and look, and there'd be homeless people sleeping in the playground. I'd call 911 and the police officers. It never stopped all summer. It didn't stop into the fall. And it's a real um, serious hazard potential for, the, for children. Sergeant Lima has been fabulous. He's on speed dial. Tony Pollock, when that incident happened last year, she was in the park with me within a few days, and within five weeks, she had floodlights installed. Unheard of speed. The neighbors, the moms, the dads, the community really appreciated that kind of, of response. And then how did the floodlights, what did that do? Well, one night I find, I go in with a friend, and I don't think anybody's in there. So we're looking around, and I'm trying to show her where I found a guy three days earlier. I'm like, he wedged himself between these two tunnels. And as I say that, two people pop up over here. And what they had done was barricade themselves in with cardboard to block the light so that they could see. <laughs> and uh, you always wonder how you're going to react in a situation like that. Let's just say my mother lion uh, mode came out and I told them in no uncertain terms that they had to get out of there. And they did. Um, so, and then this, this season, it's it's been cold, so I don't know if anybody has been in there when I've checked. I haven't found anybody. Um, but it's going to happen again. And if our children aren't safe, then we're not safe. Our park isn't safe. And we have more and more people, as you all know, coming to this area. And we need to make this really very safe and handle it properly. Um, so, that's our story. This is where we are. And now I invite the city councilors to come and sit up here, share their feelings about this, and then maybe we can have a QA and a and we can talk about what, what next steps might be. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Sal Lomatino. I am the 
our district city council uh, until January 1st. And now it's ours because we just redistricted and uh, saw the rules in a precinct. So I will miss you, but I will still be involved with the president Christopher Holmes Park. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, I wish more parks had friends like you. Because we are doing the you're helping um, not only help the city, but you're helping your neighborhood and you're giving uh, to the children in this neighborhood an opportunity to enjoy a nice park. Um, recently, I think it was last week, I filed a resolution for a hearing um, to have the city council sit down with the parks department, the BRA, the mayor's office, and to discuss financing the, our parks. The budget, believe it or not, for the parks is $16 million a year. And out of that $16 million a year, almost $11 million is spent on salaries, which leaves $5 million to maintain 240 sites, 220 parks, um, 20 squares, and various neighborhoods. I really believe that it's not enough money um, to maintain our parks. And if you look at the staffing levels over the last um, 10 years, it's at its lowest. And so the Parks Department, <coughs> I give a lot of credit to um, Commissioner Paul for the job she's doing with the little resources she has in her staff because they maintain a lot of parks. But they go in there and they clean the grass and they have to move on to another park. So I really think that we need to find some more revenues, um, particularly for the infrastructure of our parks. So we'll have a hearing and um, hopefully other city council will come up with some ideas how we could put more revenues. Uh, right now, I believe, uh, the mayor mentioned in the next couple of years, there's going to be $5 billion in new construction in downtown Boston. And I really believe that some of that money should go towards the parks. Uh, there is a fund, so if you're building downtown Boston, you have to get money, particularly if it's a housing project, 13% has to go to affordable housing. So I think that we need to maybe look at uh, changing that formula, maybe adding a couple percent to the parks. Or something. So I'm going to have that hearing. I hope that you will participate in that hearing uh, to come down and give us some ideas. Uh, in regards to uh, some of the issues with the homeless, I, I and any issue with the parks, if, if you see something, you need to report it. Um, 635 4500 is a mayor's 24-hour service. Um, you can always call my office, and you can call the police, particularly if you see that. And I don't know what the issue is in uh, because I know um, homeless people have rights, and so uh, I'll let Jim Green speak to that. Uh, but it's not just a Christopher Columbus Park. We have that issue in many parks, not even in Boston, but throughout the city where homeless, it's the homeless people come to our parks and they camp out maybe because they feel safe in some of these parks. But uh, that's what I want to do. But I just really want to thank you all for the money that you raised for the parks. And uh, I'll be glad to take some questions. I'll be glad to, as we did in the past, to do a walkthrough of the park to see if there's some um, issues that need to be addressed, address, and you know, some issues that need to be addressed. Thank you for your time. Steve, do you want to say anything? Um, I'm City Council President Steve Murphy. I'm happy to be here uh, along with my colleague, Council Lamartine, and Council Arroyo. Um, it seems, and I don't want to step on anybody's toes either, but it seems that um, it should not be too much to ask for a dedicated patrol to go into the park at a certain hour after dark and move people out of there that don't belong in there. Um, that doesn't seem like a big deal to ask. I think Tommy Lemer and Captain uh, <coughs> could be approached uh, by our uh, council members to ask for that. I, I also know that um, Although they're undermanned, the, um, the Boston Park Rangers are a um, resource in this area. They provide public safety uh, services to all of our parks. And given that this Christopher Columbus Park is isolated down 
found that maybe we could talk to Boston Park Rangers about having a, uh, a member here uh, stationed in this park. I don't know if there's going to be a pushback on that, but we could certainly bring that forward as a group uh, during budget uh, negotiations and budget discussions, which are ongoing right now. So happy to add my voice. I think it's great that um, what I've learned tonight about you folks adopting this public space and the fundraising you're doing and uh, the nurturing of this public space is above and beyond uh, what anybody uh, could do in any neighborhood of the city. So if we can't get to city resources to augment what you're doing, shame on us, frankly. So, and I'm here to add my voice to the chorus on your behalf. Thanks, Keith. I'd uh, like to say about the Rangers. Uh, last year we had a lot of problems. Um, the Rose Kennedy Rose Garden that is in Christopher Columbus Park is totally maintained by our horticulture group. Uh, they call themselves the horticulture hotties. Yeah. How many hotties do we have here? That's awesome. Uh, awesome. Rangers. <laughs> That's awesome. Come on, I can't. Okay. <laughs> they don't want to do to be a hottie. <laughs> so, um, Hottie doesn't have to. <laughs> and um, so uh, Patricia Sabi said today in an email to me that, um, that and, and this is different too, because I mean, several years ago they didn't find drug paraphernalia. And now it's very common. Of course they wear you know, closed-toed shoes and, and heavy thick gloves. But Patricia says now that they say, oh, here's a needle, it's become so common that the others just keep on pruning or doing what they're doing. The Rose Garden is locked, it has a high enough fence, and it is locked on uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights by a ranger. And Tony Pollock got that done for us, and we'll do it again this season. So we already have a little bit of in road, but we obviously need a lot more. Felix? Hi, good evening. My name is Felix Royal. Uh, along with Council Murphy, one of your four at large city councilors, I do see that the staff there from another colleague of ours, uh, Councilor Yana Preston, who couldn't be here today, but did send her staff. And, any city, at large city councilor who is intelligent follows the lead of Sal on the when it comes to Christopher and Columbus Park. And he's a great representative of yours, a good friend of both mine and Steve's. And uh, you should know, carries your interest almost daily at City Hall and has been clear with at large colleagues about what is best. I want to just join the course of folks thanking um, the people in this room for, for being such good partners, frankly, with the city. You, you're going above and beyond with the care that you put into Christopher Columbus Park. Um, from having the honor, as does Steve, of representing the entire city of Boston, we're in parks all across the city, and we could quite easily say and recognize on the BFA that Christopher Columbus Park is one of the nicest parks uh, in the city, and it is indeed because of you. And now I just learned the order for the parks. <laughs> <laughs> Get rid of them now. That never happened to me when I was there. And so I agree with what our council president said that um, phone call to the police captain here, who's a great, great crew over there, uh, and asking them to have uh, patrol walk through uh, is a very fair ask. I know it to be a fair ask because in my own neighborhood on the street that I live on, uh, we dealt with an issue, and it was a summer nights issue where some of the, the teenagers in the neighborhood were hanging out at a park that was quite literally three blocks from my home and it got loud and when you went the next day with younger kids you found things you didn't want to find uh, at a park and so I recognize what you're speaking towards and, and as a neighborhood we put in a call into our local uh, police district asked if they can drive by walking at certain times of night but they come down you know if they know you're coming they don't want to they don't want to be there and so that I think um, it's helpful I think we also as a council, uh, we understand this, but I want to voice it to the group that it's it's really bigger than your park. It, 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 and it's about what resources, and he'll, Jim will speak better to it than I. He's much more of an expert to it. My heart is in the right place. His head is also in the right place. Uh, but it's about substance abuse issues. It's about mental health issues. And it's about what resources can we put at play to deal with substance abuse and mental health and issues of homelessness because no one chooses to be homeless, right? That you don't grow up and go, I think I want to be homeless. You know, things happen to put that in play. And we have a role in government uh, to work with the roots of that issue. We also have a role in government to deal with what's going on right now in your park, and I'm not 
saying we don't. So I hope no one hears that, right? But while we're dealing with the the issue before you that you see with your eyes, if we don't deal with the root of it, it's just it's like the horticultural hardies now know this. It's the weeds, right? It's going to keep coming. If you don't pull out the roots, what's going to happen? Right, so we have to get to the root of it, and that's also part of the work we can do. And as a city, as a city council, I'm really proud of the emphasis we put on mental health and substance abuse issues. But he knows it better than I. But I think it's two tiers: it's dealing with the issue in front of you. I think a, a police officer will help, um, but also what really helps mostly is what you're already doing, Joanne. What other in the rooms is doing is if you see something, you got to say it. Yeah, yeah. I know this, and the police will tell you this, that they decide where patrols go based on where the calls come from. Right. They quite literally will walk in a room and tell you, if you see it, call us, because we use that information to decide where we send the personnel we have. So if you see it, say it, call it in. Don't just think someone else did it, right? And don't just be happy that Joanne says I did it. Call it in. You saw it, call it in. We'll do that, but then we're gonna, we really have to start looking at how do we deal with the issue of substance. Mental health is just gonna keep, keep coming. So it's a two tier, I think. Um, thanks for the time. I'm going to stick around a little longer. I do have other events in the city that I, that I promised that I would be at. My policy director, Athena Lanes, is right here in the front row, um, and she will be sticking out the duration of the meeting. So if you see me leave, my office did not leave, and we'll be, be here the whole time. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Enjoy. Mm -hmm. I think we can open up now. People have questions or observations. Oh, sorry, Jim. Sure. Sure. Happy to come. I'm, sorry. I'm Jim Green, I'm the director of the Emergency Shelter Commission, and I was uh, been with the, both the mayor's office and uh, a couple of years ago the mayor did a reorganization and moved my commission on to the Boston Public Health Commission. Um, and really with citywide responsibility for uh, policy work, planning, and problem solving around issues of homelessness. And um, you've heard from the counselors and also while you're proud residents of the North End and know this park, um, you know that from Monument Square to Mattapan, from East Boston to West Roxbury, throughout the 220 plus parks of the city, uh, we try to respond as best we can to all of the issues of homelessness. And so I, I want to point out to you all, I have a staff of three. Um, we get 1,200 calls a year from homeless families and over 700 calls from homeless individuals just seeking access to basic shelter and services. At the policy and planning level, we could not hope to try to do any of the work that we do without organizations like yours, quite frankly. Organizations that didn't set themselves up to think that we're part of the city's response to homelessness. Um, but the reality is harsher than any of us would like. Um, you have a beautiful public space situated between two of the three busiest transit hubs <coughs> in the Northeast. Um, a, a couple of winters ago, we saw there was an uptick of homeless people staying in South Station. 80 people a night, we, the kind of thing we hadn't seen since the mid 80s. Um, when we went and did a drill down and an assessment, and I spent many nights there myself talking to people, 60 of those 80 people had fallen into homelessness in a community outside of Boston, in places where there is no South Station, where there aren't the hospitals we have here, where there aren't access to substance abuse programs, um, and the prevalence there was mental health problems and substance abuse problems. At North Station, some of them, if you can go through there, you see people panhandling, etc. But when you move them along from there, where do they go? Um, and I want to say, uh, I think in 2004, I met with um, Nancy Brennan and Peter Mead at the time, uh, my good friend who heads the BRA now, was the chair of the Greenway Conservancy. And my message was the Field of Dreams message. If you build it, they will come. That there were homeless people all along the raised artery. You remember going to the Haymarket from here? Both sides of the trail, the Harbor Towers, you had Jack Bruno for years out in front of the, the Dunkin' Donuts and the barber shop. You know, Richard Steele in front of the 7-Eleven across the way. People have been here for a very long time. What we need from you, um, New England has a regional substance abuse epidemic with opiates. The counselors all know this and have held hearings. Um, Liz Malia from Jamaica Plain chairs the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Committee at the legislature. Um, that manifests itself in prescription drug abuse and injection drug abuse. And so the needles that you're seeing, it's a highly prevalent problem. That's an indicator that people are around. Often the people using 
injection drugs, etc., they may or may not be homeless. Uh, one of the reasons I didn't, I was saying to Joanne, um, one of the reasons I didn't respond earlier to some of the emails about the incident that happened here is that it was under investigation and um, we asked people connected to the medical community and the homeless service community. Boston Healthcare for the Homeless has 20 years of electronic medical records of homeless people, tens of thousands of people they've assisted. Um, the Public Health Commission runs two of the city's largest shelters, the Long Island and Woods Mullen Shelter. Uh, the gentleman who passed away here, we had no record of him receiving any services. He had spent one brief period of time in a detox. He was not somebody who was homeless here, but for the family members, whatever issues he may have had, he may have, it, you know, it's just not clear, but he wasn't somebody who was seen by outreach teams, etc. So it's an incredible tragedy that an incident like that happened here. But it shows the unpredictability of what can happen when people may have addiction issues or other problems, etc. What you all are doing in the park, the programming, the plantings, the physical space, the positive use of the park, and the eyes and ears is one of the critical ingredients because what you are doing all too often, we, well, much of the work we do you don't see. The Pine Street Band just sent me their numbers just the last two weeks. I just said, tell me the last two weeks. In the last two weeks between Long Wharf and here, in 14 nights, and they are out 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. every night, they saw four individuals. One one night, two people another night, and one a third night. And not sleeping in the top lot. We always ask them if they can dive all the top lot. Because the times that people come and go are precarious for us. Um, I was in Detroit at a conference on infant mortality and you know, other housing related problems for people when Joanne contacted me about the blood in the top lot. I, I had never heard of that incident or that, but the fact that someone used that for shelter and that someone injured herself, it turned me think, um, in that space. And I jumped out of the meeting, people said, the meeting's just getting going, what are you doing? I'm like, this is serious business. Officer Al Zalloway from the Boston Police Street Outreach Team, like me, has citywide responsibilities, but Al is everywhere. Sergeant Lima, I called, the Pine Street Outreach workers were here while, while you were still, I think, in the top lot, um, being vigilant. But for you to be eyes and ears for us about the things that are happening, for us to figure out these partnerships, how we can better extend the reach. And, and I will be honest, I told people for years, I started the daytime outreach team at Pine Street Inn uh, in 1996. Because the outreach van saw people at night, but in the daytime, services, detox centers, housing, uh, the other things homeless people need to break the cycle were available to them. Um, those outreach programs get stretched incredibly thin. They mostly work downtown. Uh, but they could work full time. Every outreach trip we have just on Boston Common in the summer weather. Councilor Lamatina and others said, but they are here. They're here every day. I think figuring out together with you um, if there could be regular kind of walkthroughs so that people know one another. Because I'm learning from Julian, you're seeing some people in the daytime. They're here less at night. But the whole notion of eyes and ears, communicating what you're seeing, figuring out with the Parks Department. Outreach workers are sort of the soft power. They can offer people a chance to go to detox, shelter. I do want to put to rest the myth that the city encourages people to stay out. I just got numbers from our Woods Mullen shelter. If more than 10,000 people stay in the Woods Mullen shelter, where there's 140 beds uh, in the past year. More than 12,000 stay at the Long Island shelter, which is a larger facility. They are at 125% of capacity. That means five homeless people are in that building for every four beds. We are doing everything we can to get people off the street, into treatment, into mental health services. But we can't do it without you. We can't do it without the support. You know, Mayor Menino loves parks. He really loves this park. And I, and I can tell you that if, if I weren't hearing from Joanne, Joanne's been willing to participate in our citywide task force on this issue and probably learn other issues, other parks, and other communities. But figuring out how we can improve the response. Um, and you've mentioned all the partners, the Parks Department, the Police Department. I'm here from the Public Health Commission. Um, but I think you know we need to look at, often people can invest in a capital project or planting or other things. But if there's more we can do on the human capital of services, um, 
people to respond. I'll make sure that once again, Joanne has numbers she can get out to all of you of how to call Pine Street's daytime outreach team, how to call their nighttime outreach team. But if there are things like regular walk arounds or better communication that we can get, I know a couple summers ago, just a preview, there were a bunch of young kids staying out at Longmore. And they started hanging out, and then they were sleeping there and partying. And to them, it looks like it's out of the way. It's kind of cool. Well, you all know that. It's, it's, it's your day now. Um, so whatever we can do to improve communication, um, respond to people's needs, the shelters will take people in. We persistently have to advocate. Every time there's a recession, the two areas that get cut the quickest in the state budget are substance use treatment and affordable housing and shelter programs. We also need your voices around the kind of services that intervene. Um, but again, uh, Joanne's been a liaison to our citywide task force to make sure that more people have the information. And maybe we can have a meeting between these meetings with some of, of your committee members to talk about how to get more support. Um, because the Greenway went forward with a lot of things, except they didn't have any storage for their maintenance programs. And there was no program I've talked to Steven Anderson and Bob Stigler about the need for, especially in the warmer weather, um, for some outreach and could we factor that into the long term strategic plan because it's a huge green space. But what happens if they displace people from the Greenway or if equity office properties displaces people from South Station? You know, so you're in this beautiful location and I think that working together. Um, you know, we want to be as responsive as possible to these issues, but you help us be proactive about what you're seeing and how to pull this together. So I just want to offer you support from, you know, Mayor Nino, my director, Dr. Barbara Farrar, who is very expert not just on homelessness, the homeless service here that we have, but addiction treatment. Um, and we will continue to try to work with you and um, strengthen the, the partnerships and the communication, because the communication that you do, that's been really key. Me. Joanne contacted the mayor's hotline, and I was in Detroit, and I knew about it within minutes of her calling the mayor's hotline. And there's that. There's also 911. For that's that's what puts it on the police's screen. And people sometimes are hesitant to call that. They think if it's only you see a crime in process, but if you see a quality of life issue, that's how they do the document. So uh, we'll continue to work with you, participate to whatever extent you need us to. And maybe we can try to think about some innovations because very often the social programming and the human resources to respond to these issues are stretched far thinner than we would ever like. But we would certainly welcome the chance to work with you. Thank you. We appreciate that, Jim. We'll take some questions now. You know, if, well, well, it's all. Did you identify yourself? Uh, my name is Joe Madden, and I live across the street at 111 Atlantic Ave. You know, it's it, it's wonderful. So you guys want to look at the long-term solution as to find the root cause of homelessness. We get it. But we have more of a short-term solution or problem in front of us in that we have to worry about, are we going to take our kids to the park tomorrow? Okay. And are we going to find blood on the slide? And that's a big deal to us. You guys can figure out, you know, how to move people around and how to get them homes and how to figure out substance abuse and all that. But we got to deal with tomorrow morning. So what we're looking for is deterrence. We know we're not gonna move them out. We live in the city, we get it. You know, homelessness is, is here, it's not going anywhere. But deterrence, something to keep them away, even to let our kids go there at eight o'clock in the morning. You know, they, they send a patrol car down at the end of Marriott Long Wharf to, wipe, to, to move these people out. I'm trying to be politically correct here, not wipe them out, but move them out. Okay, tell them to go off and do whatever they want to do. Just, you know, get them out of the way. So people can enjoy that area for the day. Though, so the tourists can. But the residents here, when we wake up in the morning at 7 o'clock, 7.30, maybe 6.30, to put our kids in the park a little bit before they go to school, and we walk on to, like I walked on to, some guy taking a nap in the tube. I, I, honestly, I'm not really all that concerned about root cause of homelessness. I'm concerned about, can I do this again tomorrow or not? So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for deterrence, not your reasons for the long-term solution to homelessness, because that's really, for me, it's, I'm not that concerned about it. I'd rather read about in the paper what you're doing, but I'd rather be able to take my kids to park tomorrow morning. 
Yeah, and I, I'd like to second that. I think that we all came to this meeting thinking this was more about the symptoms than the root cause. And it's not my kids, obviously. It's my grandkids. But, you know, I find the same problem. You know, I walk down Atlantic Avenue with my young grandkids, and there's people in front of the 7-Eleven, you know, uh, panhandling, swearing, you know, doing all, making rude remarks, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, when I do a tr try to address it, they say call 911. And that's, that's the number I call. Now, I don't understand why we have, to me, I see zero police presence in this area. I don't ever see a patrolman walking down the street. I see patrol cars going fast somewhere else, but I don't see any presence at all that would deter, going back to your point, deter this, the actions that we see all the time. So I agree, you know, there's a root cause issue. It's a, it's a social thing that we have to address. But this meeting, I believe, is about the symptoms. And what can you, how can you help us with the symptoms? And I go back to you, uh, Constable Lamantina. Uh, you brought up the budget. I don't understand, and maybe this is the way life is. But of the 16 million, 30% of it goes to salaries. There's only 5 million that goes to maintenance that maybe could help deter. Or I'd also like to understand, on a per square foot of park basis, how much this city spends versus equivalent city, and how efficient is that money being spent? and therefore helping us to deter this. So, you know, I, I think this is all about the symptom, not the root cause, which is obviously part of the problem, but I think it's a different meeting. And I think it's exactly what you're saying. I think it's how do, you, how do you stop this? You know, how do you spend the money efficiently? How do we get a patrol presence? You know, let's all dial 911 every time we see a problem. There are people that are homeless, but wow, this is, this is a real problem, particularly in the summer, but I also see it in the winter. So I think the first thing we do is I, I think that uh, we have a conversation with Captain Lee and uh, Asadi. I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. No, I, I think the first thing we do is have a conversation with Captain Lee and Asadi and Lima. Uh, and they would be here tonight, but I, I believe they're at another meeting tonight. Well, uh, actually, they, were, I, they were invited. I didn't invite them. So I, I, to, yeah. I didn't want this, yeah. you know, finger pointing. Yeah. I wanted to hear from you because right. we talked to Sergeant yeah. Lima, we talked to Jim Green, we talked to Tony Falk, we talked to all of them. I know the police are very frustrated because they say all they can do is move them, as you said, from one part to the other. They can't do anything else, and that frustrates them. So this is an overarching, it's, as you said, you know, it's not all, just our park, it's this city. Yeah. So you have police officers who are just moving, mm -hmm. hurting people around, and that doesn't solve anything. But something we could do is talk to them, have a conversation with us, make sure that we get police to check that top lot <coughs> at 6 o'clock in the line or 7 o'clock in the line to make sure there's no one in that top lot by the time you take your kids there. You know, the, the guy that goes down the end of Marriott Long Wharf, take a left. That's all we ask. Mm -hmm. So then, and, and we will have that conversation okay, with the captain and the sergeant. Hi, my name is Julie Medley, and I work in the garden on one of the cohort called Chill Puddies. Um, and I am also a nurse, and I've come across multiple syringes, and so I recognize what the risks are, but I'm okay with it. I'm careful. I wear my gloves. Um, I also have a granddaughter, and after the incident that Joanne speaks to, I she's not allowed to go in that top lot anymore. She's kind of banned from there. So when she's visiting, we walk around it, because I'm not willing to risk her coming in contact with a blood-borne illness. We know these homeless people, and we have compassion, are also at risk for carrying hepatitis C, which can live on surfaces for days, actually. So I really empathize with, with the gentleman who wants to raise his kids in the city. And I feel like, do we keep a tot lock? Do we put a large fence to keep people out? Because um, we're not going to cure the problem of homelessness in our park. We appreciate that people have to go somewhere. But what can we do with that tot lock? Because for me, it means that my granddaughter is not allowed to go there. And I'm sure living here, um, you want to be able to bring your children there. Um, and these folks who volunteer work so hard at that park, but there's no guarantee with an occasional police patrol or even a daily police patrol that this can't happen. So, so I like that. I think that's a conversation that we should talk with Commissioner Pollard. Maybe we do fence the top one and we walk it walk at any time. Um, I hate to do that, but maybe that's what we have to do. There's some parks, uh, and that's why and I, I really think that the parks are really under, 
under budget, you know, because I really believe that parks should be maintained and secure. And unfortunately, we don't have resources to maintain and secure all our parks. I just want to interject something here. Um, this is hard for me to say. Uh, my daughter was home this weekend with one of her twin boys for Mother's Day, and she didn't want to go to the playground. No, that's tough. So. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to say because we work so hard, mm -hmm. right? The other side of it is I was in New York City last year for the Greater and Greater uh, Conference. It's, it was a huge conference, right? The international people, Greenway people were there. And uh, my focus was playgrounds. And I went on many tours in New York City, Central Park, different parks. They were all had great wrought iron fences. They were all locked at night. They had great sand features. They had great water features. They were phenomenal playgrounds. Here we're worried about our, our sandbox. What could be in it? We haven't found a needle yet, but that doesn't mean it's not tomorrow. So, Janine, thank you for the suggestion of the fence. And also, the way our playground is, if you look at it, it could be enlarged. That fence could go to Atlantic Avenue, it could come over to the sidewalk, we can make a bigger playground. And then everybody's safe, and we get it locked. Yeah. And and that's one that I think that's, that's, it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing at all. If you'd seen these ones in New York, you'd say, oh my gosh, I want to do that immediately. They were amazing. So I just wanted to throw that out. Thanks. Megan? Yeah, just to kind of add on that, because I actually reached out to um, some moms this morning. And when I first thought about the fence idea, I thought, oh, well, you're going to feel so cramped in there, and that's going to be kind of awkward. And then I started asking the moms, and I can't believe the feedback I got. They are, many of them like the idea. They even came up with the idea of making it larger, expanding it, so it wouldn't feel like you were kind of always in there. Um, they sent me, this is all from this morning, 27 moms, and there's comments on here, which I can send you guys. But the first one is, I'm beyond fed up with homeless people sleeping in the playground. Sorry to sound like an alarmist, but at the end of last September, I called 911 probably five times, and every time I took the, took the kids, I would walk the entire playground looking for blood, feces, urine, needles, bottles, you threw away, oh, threw away one filled with urine once because I kept kept picture I kept picturing any of our kids getting their hands on it, etc. Before letting them play, I'm pretty I'm a pretty chill person, but after coming across as many homeless people sleeping there, I felt that this is an extreme issue. There are pros and cons to the homeless issue, but it's only getting worse. And they just go on and on with their comments. And this is all just in a day from the moms from the And also, and I, I told you, I'll do, and I'm sure my fellow council is probably do. Maybe we'll have a hearing by fencing top lots in the city. Because we started in our first night, so we uh, did something recently where we didn't want people smoking mm -hmm. in top lots. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, uh, so they started putting signs up at top lots, no smoking. So maybe we'll have a city council hearing in regards to that issue, and hopefully you'll come and testify in support of fencing to talk lot, and then they close at a certain time, maybe 8 o'clock, or 9 o'clock in the summertime, or 6 o'clock in the November time, or something like that. So we'll, maybe Steve Murphy and myself, all three of us, we'll do a resolution for a hearing. If that helps. Uh, I'm Michelle Bergen. Sal, how do they handle this at the Commons, which is a much larger geographic area than Christopher Columbus Park, with a much wider, vagrant area than what we've got up here? How do they handle this situation? They, they have park rangers at the Commons, and at Franklin Park, that's where they're predominantly stationed. And they also have uh, dedicated Boston police cars going in there to move people along. They just move them along. I mean, they're there. But they move them along. It's a huge problem. Let me just offer it. You know, it's a huge problem. I just had a meeting with the head of the Friends of the Public Garden about the Brewer Fountain. They spent millions of dollars on the Brewer Fountain. But there are a lot of homeless people and we have no, I understand your desire for the immediate proactive piece. The social service side, 
we, we don't have a homeless removal service. We don't have the, the bodies to be down there. So you're, it is the police and the park rangers. It's people with some authority over a site to try to move people along. I think, I think we understand that, and I think it is on everybody. And I know, you know that you call 911 and you document that. But I'm with all of you, and we're all on the same page. What happens tomorrow morning? Mm -hmm. This is our issue. Mm -hmm. And when I'm up, I'm getting myself up at 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm retired. I don't need to get up at 6 o'clock. <laughs> and my mission is only to go, thank you, is only to go and check the top lot. And make sure it's Safe. And make sure it's safe. Yeah, I'm sorry. You know, and we do it in the Rose Garden too. And well, the road, you know, so we really need the dedicated will, patrols, sorry. and not at six in the morning. We need them there at one in the morning. And yeah. to go and look, they have to go into the top lot. They can't just eyeball it on the street. Because believe me, I got stuff that way. Yeah, I just want to say, Joanne, uh, it's it's why these conversations work. Um, Council President Murphy proposed an idea about. Would be having a more uh, patrol in the public park uh, based on the Donovovia, based on the head nods. It's clearly that's something people want to do. We heard about the fence idea. I agree with Sal. I don't want to speak to Steve, but I'm certain the three of us will work on hearing the idea of uh, bringing a fence into the park. And, um, and if for any reason other parks are interested in this, it sounds like you are, and so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you want to be in our pilot project, right? So, so, um, and and I think we we can, while we might want to have this conversation citywide, uh, you know, each neighborhood is going to have their own ideas about that topic. But it sounds like, uh, again, I'm not running a vote here, but it sounds like there's some emails we've gotten with the head nods are saying that this particular group that worked so hard with this park is very interested in looking at fencing the top, and so uh, I'm. I'm getting for both of those, and I'm, I'm working with my colleagues here, and with you, and with you. Sorry to give you my back on the fencing of the, the top lot and increasing the patrols. And I think uh, the sooner we can get that stuff done, then the more likely folks can wake up in the morning and go to the park and use it for what it's meant to be used for. The children will be able to have a safe place to play, um, uh, and, and for you to be able to have a place to be with your family, with your children, or grandchildren. So, excuse me, but I, I, you know, the that's great. Yeah, but. That is, there's still problems in general where we need police presence. So if you take Fidelity Park right outside of Emac and Bolios where kids like to go and it's open late, that place it can be really dangerous with drug dealers and all kinds of good stuff. So yeah, let's build the fence, but let's not forget about the rest of this north end uh, area which has a continuing problem. No so, attempt on my end to do that. I was just speaking yeah, so I, I'm cool with defense, but I think we need to look at the overall problem on a tactical basis, not so much strategically. Like five years from now, you know, we'll fix it. Let's yeah. talk about no, you know moving forward. You know, you know, to, to that to that point, I, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. You know, I mean, if we were to deal with this, let's say today, I mean, Rome wasn't built in a day, and Sal, you, you've done an amazing job over the years with the North End, and we all appreciate it. But you know, really, what it boils down to, I mean, if we had to deal with something head on right now. I mean, the most important thing that we're dealing with, and I know I'm speaking from a biased perspective because I have kids, but it's our kids. Okay? Yeah. I mean, the rest of the park, wonderful, you know, I mean, you know, if we're all big people, we can deal with a couple of homeless people here and there, or even several, that's fine. But it's just, you know, our kids, they shouldn't have to do deal with that. And we, frankly, I don't really want to have that conversation with them right now. I mean, I'd like to wait a few years until they get a little older to discuss with them why this is going on. And if we can at least, you know, keep the, the tot lots a little bit safe, then I think we're okay. And then we can move to where you're talking about exactly of uh, the whole community and trying to work with that. But, I, I mean, I, I think that the kids are probably the most important thing that we're dealing with at this point. Well, I agree. I just saying if you could do the fencing, but you could also put a police presence here yeah. just as quickly. Well, 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 that's, that's what this is. We so have a first conversation. Do. Great. We Let's have, have a conversation with the police. And I wish the police were invited to that. Yeah, me too. But they're not here. So we will have that conversation with the captain. Uh, I do one more question. Uh, we were talking about in Twin, the squad cars coming around or whatever. That, uh, they can't see into our top water or anything. But why can't we have even the bike patrols on a constant basis? You know, on a sign there, just like we were talking about, and even some officers on bicycles, at least they've been in the park instead of out on Atlantic Avenue. 
I will arrange a meeting with the captain, Sergeant, and Joanne to get the signal. The question about cameras is brought up. Cameras will, I mean, whatever they want to do is fine, but that only documents the afterwards. Because, uh, thank God they had them at the finish line, but I, I don't want a camera to back and see what the homeless guy did in the park. You know, I want them out of there. In the, yeah, well, I think they often know who they are. They do. Oh, yeah, they, they do know who they are. And, and that's the sad part. They are documented. Um, did anybody else have one more question? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I'm, uh, I'm Bob Spiegberg, I'm the Superintendent of Maintenance and Security for the uh, Rose Kennedy Greenway Conservancy. Um, and I just wanted to kind of let you all know that we, we're experiencing all the same things. We don't have a top lot on the Greenway, so there is that not that sort of immediate issue that, um, and I, my kids are a little older now, but I think if I had younger kids I would feel, yeah, why not fence it in. Um, but going back to the, the police presence, um, you know, I've, I've become very frustrated with um, the lack of response, and um, it's, it's tough. I mean, I have security in my job title, and I just don't feel like there's really anything I can do. I don't have the resources within the Conservancy um, and the Boston Police Department. I just, I feel they need to step up a little bit and help us out, because we have no one else to turn to. So, um, you know, and, and I feel your pain. Um, we're, we're, you know, if you move them out of your park, you're going to go in our park, and vice versa. Uh, it's it's kind of a they just they just move from one place to another. We're not going to solve it tonight, but um, you know anything I can do to help you, and uh, I'd be happy to do so. Thank you. Okay. We're all in this together. Just a quick question, and I think Sal will know when you're talking to the sergeant and the captain. Is there a specific homelessness unit or a patrol unit with the police department, or is it just a general 911 number that goes out? Because usually, if you, I know a few years, because we were talking about, I want to show my age here or whatever, but years ago, they used to have a unit that I think uh, Phil here, so followed them around at one point, when they were patrolling primarily parks and areas. And they got to know, like you say, like, what's his name? I know the fellow you referred to in the back, you know, but Lee or whatever the fellows, they knew who these homeless people were and got to become acquainted with these people, believe it or not, because there was a unit at one time years ago that went specifically from park to park, knew where these people, especially, I mean, let's go back to even before the big dig, the big dig, walking from Hanover Street to Quincy Market, when you walk through that smell like urination throughout the whole, you had to hold your breath by the time you crossed over. But there were police who knew them, knew where to go, where they were, and would move them. And I don't know, and then of course we can go back to years ago and target, again bringing up the subject, but there were a lot more places years ago, rather than move them from park to park, they would put these fellas, pick them up in the old paddy wagons, like they used to call them, they would put them, they would take them to a shelter, and they would be at the shelter for an evening or the rest of the evening, it was a cold night, they would get them in, God bless them, it has been for years going out on this mission of fund in the cold weather or picking them up and bringing them in and taking them out of the cold but that was done continuously i know the staffing and the budget is a lot you know different today too but that's the thing and because i, I know what the joint saying and the police have expressed that concern about they pick them up where do they go do they take them to another park is there something you know we talk about the need for affordable housing and there is the need for affordable housing but maybe there's a need down the road of a shelter for homelessness so when these people are picked up, that the police can bring them to a particular location and let them either spend the night there or whatever. And some of these people don't want to do that, but if they're going to maintain and be sleeping in the parks, they're going to know they're going to get picked up and go someplace. And maybe it would hold them back from going to a situation. I just want to just pull that out for Lima. By the way, when I do the patrol with the police, they ask me to leave. <laughs> 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 So I mentioned Officer Al Zoloway, and the, the, the commissioner, I'm mean, meeting with the commissioner on this issue. Officer Al Zoloway and Officer Michelle Maffeo were a team of two under Deputy Superintendent Nora Baston. Um, but again, it's citywide responsiveness. Officer Zoloway was down here within minutes of my call uh, last last spring. Um, but I, you know, I think people are raising very real issues. You know, Bob, I invoked the Greenway before, that, that these are huge problems. You know, the mayor introduced uh, an ordinance to tighten the restrictions around panhandling. The council supported the council supported that ordinance, but um, you know, you've got state 
police responsibility over on ramps and off ramps at Boston Police. I think getting them down there, but certainly bringing officers all the way in to the conversation. He works with the community service officers like Sergeant Lee, but he's, he's very diligent. Yeah. Joanne, sorry to bother. I used to be the director of media relations for Logan Airport. I suggest that you call Logan Airport. They have a terrific homeless program. They work with the state police, they work with the airlines, and they work with the shelters. And it, it's been working for years and years and years. Uh, they treat them respectfully. They say, go get the hell out of here. They work out a way that they can get into shelters or explain to them they can't sleep on these benches and stuff. You may want to talk to them, and it's being run by the operations staff. Okay. Mm -hmm. Andy, you have well, I just, I'm concerned about the homeless too, but right now my priority, and I think the priority of our group, is the safety of the tot lot, and I, and I appreciate what you've said tonight. I think right away we need not a city -wide. I care about the city, but I really care about the North End, and more specifically about this park. And I would like all of the parents to feel safe when they bring their children there this summer. So I hope that we can get this moving now, that we've had the chance to discuss it and know how everyone feels. And along with that, a new presence. And it would be great if we could go back to the patrols and all of that, but we know there's a budget issue and that's not going to happen overnight. But whatever we can do to strengthen that, and we can be the eyes and ears for them also. Appreciate what you've done. Well said. Well, thank you. And I really want to thank our city councilors. Yeah. Thank you. I really want to get a positive response from Councilor Leanne Presley and John Conley, also included. With that, I'd like to say congratulations to our new vice president, Ann Babbitt. Welcome to the I thank all of you. It was a wonderful turnout. I know that meant it means a lot to all of you, so I appreciate you being here.